Hey everybody, welcome to Money's No Object. I'm your host, Dylan Howell. This is episode number 374 of our YouTube channel and podcast. And I cannot be more excited to continue sharing with you guys personal finance topics that I think can be useful for you in your long-term financial journey. Today, we are going to be talking about money rules and specifically the money rules of a Harvard-trained economist. Uh, and I wanna see how uh, his money rules kind of line up with our financial action plan, what I think about money, what I'm teaching you about money on a day-to-day -day basis, just to kind of see if there's some, just to kind of see if there's some uh, congruence there and to see if we can uh, find a good bit of common ground. And I think you'll be surprised uh, that there is more in common uh, than you would otherwise uh, believe to be so. So uh, stick around for a discussion of all that and more in today's episode. Before we get started though, if you could go down below, hit the big red subscribe button, like this video, leave me any feedback in the comments down below, and I'll be sure to respond to anything you leave down there. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify podcasts, be sure to subscribe and leave me a review on either one of those platforms. Follow me on social media at MNO with Dylan, and that's really good supplemental materials to all the things I'm putting out in these long form episodes on YouTube and the podcast every single day. And then if you need somebody to help you to build a financial plan and keep you accountable to that plan over the long term, then I can do that. Just DM me on any of the major social media sites and tell me that you are interested in financial coaching sessions. And you and I can begin working together, pushing towards your long-term financial goals and ultimately pushing you on towards long-term financial freedom, which is what I hope for every single individual who's watching or listening to this show on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, we all have our own opinions when it comes to money, right? Uh, we all have different rules that we live by, different things uh, that we do. I, I actually read a book recently that talks about how different money managers manage their own money, right? How they actually deal with their own money and how sometimes it's not in line and often it's not in line with how they would advise a client just because everybody is so different, right? Not because they're inconsistent and not because uh, they're wrong, but because everybody has different circumstances, everybody has different thought processes, and um, they have to come to their own conclusions about their own money. And that's also true uh, of the individual I'm going to talk about today, uh, Lawrence uh, Kotlikoff, right? I hope I'm saying that uh, correctly. He contributed to a CNBC article, um, and he basically is just saying, hey, here are 21 money rules that I have. Um, and I just want to go through these rules, see uh, what the overlap looks like between these rules and the rules that I would have, uh, just to kind of see, hey, are, are people getting good things from uh, some of these mainstream media articles or not? Uh, but just so you know, um, Dr. Kotlikoff, he is an economics professor and author of Money Magic, uh, an Economist's Secrets to More Money, Less Risk, and a Better Life. He received his PhD in economics from Harvard in 1977. Uh, he served on the faculties of UCLA and Yale uh, and served as a senior economist with the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, his columns have appeared in several different places, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Financial Times, all these different places, right? Uh, not to mention he is a, a highly published uh, author in uh, academia as well. So this guy has some credibility, and so I just want to go through his money rules and see what is up. So, uh, as an economist, here are the top 21 money rules uh, that he lives by and that he teaches. The first is don't borrow for college. Well, you can go ahead and put a check mark beside that because you know uh, how I feel about borrowing for college. He says it's far too risky and expensive. Uh, I don't say this lightly. I'm a college professor. Uh, but you can get a fine education without mortgaging your future and potentially dashing your career plans. Uh, it simply involves pursuing scholarships and applying to less expensive, uh, if generally less prestigious institutions, right? Uh, and I tell you the exact same thing. I tell you the exact same thing on this show all the time, that we do not need to be borrowing for college. And, and don't you think it's funny that you're hearing this from uh, two people who teach at the college level, uh, Dr. Kotlikoff and myself, right? Uh, so do not borrow for college. I will second that any day of the week. Okay. Now, the second one says, if your parents are borrowing for your tuition, discuss who will repay. Now, this is not something I cover very often, but it's something that I think is very important, right? Because um, very often do parents take out like parent plus loans or uh, take out loans of their own uh, for their child's education. And 
I don't like this either. I don't like borrowing for uh, college regardless. But if uh, parents are borrowing for their children, that can create a lot of um, you know relational strain, now, especially if you don't know who's going to repay. And especially if uh, the child goes and, and they don't uh, graduate on time or they change majors, or they do this, or they do that. Um, you know, the parents are going to have something to say about that. And rightfully so if they uh, are paying for uh, the tuition. But uh, if the child says, hey, I'll pay you back. And, you know, they agree to this uh, payback between the, the child and the parent, then, um, you know, how much say does the parent really have? Because it's not their money in the long run anyway. But uh, regardless, right, you need to know I need to make sure that you're not blowing your inheritance or sacrificing your welfare by helping um, you know, your child, your child attend uh, an unaffordable college, right? Again, we do not want you to be borrowing for school regardless, but if you are doing it, uh, if the parent is doing it, uh, then you need to have that conversation because all the time, especially like on the Dave Ramsey show, you hear people call in, uh, yeah, my mom took out, you know, $100,000 in student loan debt. Now she, you know, expects me uh, to pay for it. It was for my school, all this type of stuff, but we never agreed on it. You need to have that kind of thing lined out. So I don't want to harp too long on that one, but I just think that's something I don't talk about very often on the show uh, that I could hit on right there. So the third thing is strive to own your home, not rent, and try to buy in cash. Now, this is interesting, and this is something I would also uh, put a check by. Now, uh, I do tell you that if you are renting prior to having your financial foundation set where you have your emergency fund, you're out of debt, you know, things like that, um, then keep renting, right? Don't buy a house when you're not ready to buy a house. But uh, he says, this is particularly the case if you're a moderate to high earner. Uh, having more of your money packed in your home is a way to shelter it from federal and state asset income taxation. And this is true, right? But this is not always the reason that I would suggest to do this. Um, just having your house to yourself, owning your own home uh, can really be uh, a decrease in risk over the long term. And I think we'll see that uh, in one of these one of these subsequent money rules uh, that Dr. Kotlikoff has here. So the fourth thing, uh, the fourth money rule that he has is that mortgages are tax and financial losers. Pay them off ASAP. And you know that the seventh part of the financial action plan says to what? It says to pay off your mortgage early. Okay. So he says, think about it. If you have $100,000 that you can invest right now in a bond earning 1.5%, you'd have $1,500 in interest income over the course of a year. But if you had $100,000 debt uh, at a 3.2% interest uh, that you could pay off right now, you'd save $3,200 over the course of the year in interest payment. On balance, you'd make $1,700 with no risk by investing in debt uh, repayment rather than investing in the bond. Now, this is true, right? Uh, and others may argue, well, you know, what about investing in the stock market or whatever? But again, that is another level of risk, right? Those are not congruent risks uh, that we're talking about there. Here, we're talking about a bond, debt, and debt. Uh, so I think this is uh, a reasonable comparison. So mortgages are not good to hold for the long term. You do need to get them paid off as soon as possible. So, so far, you see quite a few things that we're like, yeah, th this is... Um, you know, right in line with uh, with what I teach you guys on a regular basis. Then the fifth money rule says owning a home can reduce longevity risk. Okay, so here's another reason it's better to own instead of rent. Let's say you're 70 and have found your dream location. Renting for the rest of your life runs the risk of rent hikes without the possibility of your fixed income increasing. In contrast, if you owned your home, uh, home prices can soar or collapse, but you'll be insulated since you'll neither uh, be buying or selling your home. Who cares what the market does, right? Your housing consumption is guaranteed uh, throughout the end of your day. So once you own your home, uh, it takes away the risk of uh, things that you will owe in the future because rents could skyrocket, right? Uh, and the price of homes could skyrocket. And if you are taking out a mortgage uh, or even worse, renting, uh, then you could be in a place where uh, there's a lot of big costs ahead. So having your home paid off is a big deal. So uh, that's his fifth rule. And again, I would say, just put a check mark by it. That's exactly what I would do. Now, the sixth money rule uh, says that your perfect home may be far cheaper several time zones away. Uh, or it may be someplace with no state income tax, no state estate tax, and no state inheritance tax. Yes, things are more complicated, right? 
Uh, land values in New Hampshire may be higher in light of the state's tax advantage and the school system may be better in Massachusetts, but who knows, right? You may be childless and happy to live in a tall five-decker with no yard, right? Uh, so your perfect home, the home that you're going to end up owning, um, may not be exactly where you wanted it to be. And, and all this, you know, I think here comes down to uh, personal preference. Sometimes uh, location is not uh, up to our own just choosing. And and many times it is, but uh, so many people want to live, uh, you know, really close to their families or, uh, you know, they want to stay at this particular job or whatever. So this one, you know, fine. I, I do agree that your perfect home may not be exactly where uh, you want it to be, but um, you know, this really is a matter of personal choice here. And there's a lot of emotions tied up into exactly where uh, you're going to live. So even though this is true, um, it's not something that I would necessarily push. Now, the seventh money rule he has is choose jobs that everyone but you hates. You may say, well, why? What do you mean? Jobs that everybody but me hates. Well, all else being equal, skills, education, uh, and experience, uh, people with unpleasant, nerve-wracking, insecure, disturbing, or financially risky jobs get paid more than people with the same skills working jobs with none of these drawbacks. Economists call the extra pay a compensating differential. The key to taking advantage of it uh, is to find something that you love and ideally others don't, right? Uh, so basically what, what we're saying here, right, uh, is if there is extra risk to a job, extra skill involved, uh, extra stress involved, whatever, right? Um, it will require a higher pay and it'll typically have fewer people that want to do said job. But if you can find a job like that and you actually love doing it, uh, then you can kind of find that sweet spot uh, and get some pretty nice compensation uh, even with some of those drawbacks, because maybe, you know, you are better uh, adept at, you know, absorbing said drawbacks than uh, somebody else. And maybe you just really love that thing. So uh, I think that is actually very, very good advice. Uh, again, something that I don't, you know, talk about on the show on a regular basis. Uh, but if you can find a job that everyone but you hates, right, or, you know, most people but you hates, uh, then you can actually make some really good money over a long period of time uh, and have some really good job security. Now, the eighth uh, money rule that he has is don't worry about career and job hopping. Uh, so how can you not shop around when there are so many options? Certainly, the fastest path to a raise uh, is to get a credible outside offer. Now, this really speaks to the world that we're in today. Uh, it speaks to this world of uh, you know, job hopping and finding new jobs that pay better and all these types of things. And uh, I think that's perfect. I think that's perfectly reasonable, especially uh, if the job that you have is not uh, keeping up with the, um, you know, salary requirements that you have, the benefit requirements that you have, um, and things stay pretty stagnant. You don't want things to stay stagnant. You want to grow uh, within your position. And so I think this is actually uh, a really uh, good word of advice. But um, I think if you can find a place that, you know, meets your needs and continues to do so, uh, continues giving you raises, all these types of things, it, it can be, um, you know, a valuable asset. But like he says here, the fastest path to a raise is an outside offer because uh, you might find far more value in the market than you find uh, just wherever you're at. And, and this is very true uh, in you know where I work in academia, right? Uh, you'll see full professors, right? Tenured full professors uh, who make a certain amount, uh, but you'll have incoming professors, assistant professors, making more than the full professors, typically because uh, there's a lot of, you know, competition in that assistant professor market, the prices go up, but those full professors, they're kind of staying uh, in their place and don't require as much uh, in the way of raises over time. So uh, you see this happen. And so uh, don't worry too much about job hopping. I would tend to agree. Then uh, the ninth thing is consider working for yourself. So he says, I tell this to my students often, if you start the right business the right way, it will raise your remaining future earnings and provide unmatched job security. That sounds too risky. Brainstorm ways to turn your hobby and interests into a side hustle. And I agree with this wholeheartedly, right? Uh, if you can find the right way uh, to start a business and to work for yourself, by all means do it because you'll have all the more independence. Um, I mean, I, I just, I agree with that for sure. 
Then uh, the tenth thing that he has is keep thinking about tomorrow. And boy, are you talking to the right guy if you want to talk about keep thinking about tomorrow. You can put a big check mark by this one uh, because here's what he says. Are you in the best possible career for the rest of your working days? Should you make a switch? Is your current job in danger? Set a date every few months to do a career review with a spouse, partner, or friend. So he's basically saying always look forward uh, to what may be coming and what may be best for you. And uh, that's something that I really, really uh, condone and live by is to really pay attention to what tomorrow is going to have to hold for you uh, and plan accordingly. Then the 11th money rule is that your living standard is your bottom line. So he says, uh, simulate its potential paths based on alternative investment and spending strategies to see where these strategies can land you, right? So your living standard is your bottom line. And, and I tend to agree with this, right? I talk to you guys all the time about spending money, about uh, budgeting properly, and how living above your means can be extremely costly for you. And so uh, he's saying your living standard, whatever standard you live by is your bottom line, is uh, what you're going to end up having as far as money goes. Because the lower your living standard, the more money that you can put away and invest for the future and give and all those types of things, right? Uh, and spend on yourself doing other things, the higher your living standard, uh, then the less money that you have to spend on you know, other frivolous things, the less money you have to give, the less money you have to invest, right? Uh, so, you know, he's saying here, you can choose, you can choose whatever your living standard is, but just know that is going to determine what your bottom line is. Then uh, the 12th money rule that uh, Dr. Kotlikoff has uh, is marriage beats partnering long term. And boy, is this going to uh, poke the bear of some people uh, who nowadays don't believe this to be true, but uh, it is extremely true um, I mean, I'm married and just had my fourth anniversary with my wife, um, and it's 100% true. It may mean somewhat higher net taxes, uh, but it comes with an array of valuable implicit insurance arrangements, uh, which the formality and legality of marriage help to enforce, right? Um, and in many cases, it leads to lower uh, taxation than otherwise, because it's not like they just multiply all the income tax brackets by two in order to get to the uh, married brackets. It's not not quite that, right? Uh, so ultimately, uh, there can be some tax advantages. There can be some insurance advantages. And then ultimately, having somebody who you are accountable to and who you can work with and that you can uh, follow a plan together with, uh, it's extremely valuable. It provides accountability. It provides uh, somebody who, you know, is going to be there over the long term. I think for sure, check the box, marriage beats partnering long term. And not to mention, uh, if a marriage ends, at least there's some legality to it. Uh, but if a partnership ends, then that's going to be extremely messy because, um, you know, that's like, you know, having a roommate that you owned everything with, which uh, is just extremely messy. So the 13th thing that he has here is something that I actually don't agree with. Okay. Um, and I, I mean, I see what he's saying, but it just, I don't, I don't, you know, coincide with this, this way of thinking. He said, if you do get married, count on getting divorced. I'm like, okay, well, if I'm getting married, I don't really want to get divorced. He says, uh, it's as likely as not, uh, protect yourself and the love of your life with a prenup. Now, the only situation in which I think a prenup is, um, smart is if both individuals come into the marriage uh, with substantial assets or one individual comes into the marriage with substantial assets. And when I say substantial assets, I mean uh, millionaire status type assets, right? Uh, or maybe close to millionaire status type assets. I think if you're not above the $500,000 in uh, net worth, uh, then there's no reason for a prenup. Not only that, right? I just don't see uh, the value in counting on getting divorced. Now, uh, like I said, especially, right, if you're coming in and you already have things, it can be valuable to have a prenup. But let's say like my wife and I, we both entered marriage, we didn't have anything, right? Uh, we're building together. And I don't think that that's necessary in that case. And I, I think that, um, you know, statistically, yes, you know, there, you know, marriages uh, end at a very high rate. Uh, but that does not mean that it has to be you. It does not mean it has to be you uh, and your spouse, but you have to do things in a proper way. And I'm not going to make this episode all about marriage. I'm just saying uh, nobody wants to get married and count on getting divorced. I, I don't think 
um, you know, if that's in the back of your mind, then I don't think that you're entering a marriage with the right mindset at all. So uh, you can put an X by that one, but uh, let's see about the next ones. Number 14, um, Dr. Kotlikoff says that all lifestyle decisions, switching careers, moving homes, getting married, having kids, getting divorced, come at a price. Now, I say this is 100% uh, true. He said, measure these prices in terms of your sustainable living standard. Okay, so he's right, right? If you want to change careers, it's going to cost you. If you want to move, it's going to cost you. You want to get married, it's going to cost you, right? You want to have kids? Trust me, it's going to cost you. My wife and I had uh, a son uh, in 2021, and it's, you know, it's costly, not just uh, monetarily, but your time and your effort. It's costly, right? Of course, getting divorced is extremely costly, right? Uh, so he's basically saying, hey, take all these prices into account, uh, and compare them to your living standard, right? Are you actually going to be able to pay the price uh, if some of these decisions come along in your life? Uh, and that's where saving and being disciplined uh, financially comes into play, right? If you're very disciplined and you can put away money for any of these things, then uh, you can end up with good financial outcomes. Then number 15, use retirement account contributions, conversions, and withdrawals to cut your lifetime taxes and make sure to contribute enough to get your employer's match. So big check by this one too, right? Because I teach this on this show on a daily basis, right? What am I always teaching? I'm always teaching to take the match, right? That's the third part of the financial action plan is to take the employer match if it is offered to you, right? I'm telling you guys all the time about 401ks, Roth 401ks, Roth IRAs, traditional IRAs, HSAs, all these types of things, right? Uh, that have tax advantages, right? And the reason that we invest in things that have tax advantages is so we can keep more of our income over our lifetime, right? That would be the absolute reason to do that. The reason that people convert from uh, traditional to Roth would be to decrease their taxes over a long period of time, right? Uh, the reason that, you know, people really have to plan out the withdrawals that they take from their uh, accounts and what account you take it from and what investment you liquidated in order to get it, right? All that is going to help to cut your lifetime taxes and just a little uh, attention and uh, a little time can help you to plan this out properly uh, and get yourself to a point uh, where you, you know, pay less taxes than you would have had to otherwise. Now, don't get uh, overly, you know, legalistic about it all and try to just decrease your taxes to zero. Sometimes, you know, you're just not going to be able to step away from paying taxes or it's not going to be worth what you would spend to have a CPA figure out how to uh, decrease your taxes by some marginal amount. Uh, but making those contributions, doing those types of things with your investment accounts can be very valuable to your lifetime taxes. Sixteenth money rule is to wait until age 70 to take Social Security benefits. Retirees who wait to claim can get hundreds of dollars more each month than those who can take benefits early. Of course, this isn't feasible for everyone, but here's my plea. Before making any moves, figure out the strategy that maximizes your household's total lifetime benefits. And the reason, and, and ultimately, when it comes to Social Security, right, uh, we don't know how long we're going to live. And so we don't know what benefit would be best for us, right? We, If you live to only be 65, then you missed out on three years of benefit, right? Uh, if you live to only be, you know, 72, then, you know, was taking it at 70 the best benefit that you could have had? The answer is very likely no, right? Uh, so we don't know exactly, but we need to weigh our risks. Uh, and basically what he's saying here is if you can wait this long with Social Security, you can get your maximum uh, benefit at age 70. Uh, and getting that maximum benefit uh, will be great because it will decrease the amount of money that you have to pull off of your nest egg in retirement, uh, which is useful. But again, if you only live until like 72 or maybe even 75, right, um, then that benefit may not have been the best one for you. Uh, but there's really no exact way to know. And so uh, I don't 100% agree with this. A lot of times I say the sooner you can take it, the better, because uh, you're more likely to have more years on the back end, even though like, he's right, you can get hundreds of dollars more. Uh, there's no guarantee that those hundreds of dollars will make it as far uh, as the um, you know money that you're getting in your early Social Security payments. So uh, not a total agreement here, but I see what he's saying, okay? Then the 17th rule, if you don't formally request your social security benefits, you won't get it. So he says, I've had many people in their mid-70s ask me when they'll start getting their checks. 
And that's when I groan and tell them that they need to file for their benefits immediately. Social Security isn't in the business of letting us know what it owes us, never mind what we paid in FICA, in FICA taxes our entire working lives for those benefits, right? Uh, so you have to reach out to Social Security. Very, very good uh, thought here and something that I have not covered before, but I would definitely agree with. The 18th rule that he has here is the Social Security Administration's program operations manual system has thousands of rules which its staff can get wrong in part uh, or in full. So talk to multiple offices and do your research. So that's just more about Social Security. Again, uh, do your due diligence there. The 19th thing, he says, is retiring early is financial suicide. So let's see what he says here. Yes, there are situations where retiring early makes sense, but very, but very few of us think uh, of early retirement as what it really is, a decision to take the longest and most expensive vacation that most of us can't afford, right? Putting it in this way makes clear that the wonderful benefits, extra time with the grandkids, freedom to pursue hobbies, reduction in stress, all come at a high price. The loss of years, if not decades, of earnings. And so he's right about this, right? And now I wouldn't be as strict as to say this is financial suicide. I don't think it's financial suicide uh, to retire early. And I think if it's going to take away stress for you and it's going to help you to uh, do things that you want to do in your financial life uh, or just in your life in general, right? Have that freedom to pursue things that you want to be able to spend time with your family, by all means, retire early, right? Uh, I don't think that is financial suicide. I think that's exactly what we build up our finances for. We build up our finances to have options and have uh, the freedom to make those types of decisions. But he is right about this. He's right about this. There's a high price, right? If you retire at 50, uh, you're taking away, let, let's just say 15 years uh, of earnings, right? And yes, you're living off of your investments now, but your investments could be growing without you touching them. Uh, and they're not, you're actually touching them. And so um, it decreases the amount that you're going to have over the long term set aside for yourself. But uh, if it helps you to meet your long-term financial goals, then by all means, retire early, okay? Uh, then the 20th money rule uh, is that most conventional investment advice is to be nice of dubious value. Uh, it's predicated on you making four major economic mistakes. Saving the wrong amount when you're younger, putting your pre-retirement savings on autopilot, spending the wrong amount when you're older, and never adjusting to market conditions. And um I mean, I do, you know, I do agree, right? And I've told you guys before that uh, a lot of advisors are not going to add a lot of value to you. Um, that's why I try to keep it simple on the show. I'm not giving you individual investment advice. I'm telling you things that I do, and I'm telling you things that uh, are valuable to the masses. Um, but I, I would say that he's right. Most investment advice is not going to be extremely valuable, at least to you as an individual. Um, but there is some that, that would be, um, and so just have a good filter of the good and the bad. Then the last thing here, the last uh, money rule is that if you're worried about downside risk, play the stock market like a casino. So he says, think of the investment in stocks as cash that you take to the casino. Don't spend a penny of your winnings, uh, if you make any, uh, until you've left the building. Or in other words, don't put more money into the stock market until your initial bets are safe from losses. I don't a hundred percent agree with this. I think a lot of our worry about downside risk comes from uh, us not understanding what we're investing in, not, um, you know, this fact that we think it's all just, you know, pure speculation and pure gambling. Uh, but nonetheless, I do think you should be investing in the stock market uh, and whatever you have to do uh, to work yourself into the proper, you know, risk return uh, place in the market, please, by all means, do so, so you can make the returns that the market will offer you. Just a couple of final thoughts, right? I do think uh, that some of these rules are very good. I think that some of these rules are very useful. Uh, I do think he leaves quite a few things out here, uh, things that I do talk about on this show. But uh, overall, I think it is surprising to note uh, how in line the things that he teaches and the things that he says are with what I teach on a regular basis. You may say, well, how's that weird? Well, it's weird because I don't teach things uh, all the time that are um, of common acceptance, right? It's not commonly accepted to pay off your home, right? It's not commonly accepted uh, to, you know, just talk about your risk reward relationship uh, with your investments and not just say invest everything uh, in the market. You know, it's not, it's not common uh, to do those types of things. And so um, 
I, I think that these are good tips, good rules, but uh, there are many more that you could add to this list that would be extremely valuable. But that's what I'm here for. I'm here for on a daily basis, not just to uh, give you a list of 21 things. I'm here to be as comprehensive in my coverage of your personal finances as possible. And we will continue that uh, in tomorrow's episode. So thanks for watching this video. If you could go down below, hit the big red subscribe button, like this video, leave me any feedback in the comments down below, and I'll be sure to respond to anything you leave down there. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify podcasts, be sure to subscribe and leave me a review on either one of those platforms. Follow me on social media at MNO with Dylan, and that'll be really good uh, supplemental materials to all the things I'm putting out in these long form episodes on YouTube and the podcast every single day. And then if you need somebody to help you to build a financial plan and keep you accountable to that plan over the long term, then I can do that. Just DM me on any of the major social media sites and tell me that you are interested in financial coaching sessions. And you and I can begin working together, pushing towards your long term financial goals and ultimately pushing you on towards long term financial freedom, which is what I hope for every single individual who's watching you're listening to this show on a day-to-day -day basis. So tune in tomorrow as I continue talking about personal finance topics that I think could be useful for you in your long-term financial journey. So thanks for tuning into this episode of Money's No Object. I'm your host, Dylan Howell. God bless.